Best Book Bits podcast brings you Patrick Long, author of the book, Ordinarily Extraordinary. Patrick, thanks for being on the podcast. Oh yeah, thank you. I appreciate this opportunity. This is awesome. No worries. So for my audience that uh, don't know who you are, give us a, a little brief story about who you are, uh, what the book's about, and um, how you got to where you are now on your journey. Yeah, I'm a from St. Louis, Missouri. I'm a father of four young kids, and my book is a memoir. It's nonfiction. My wife, Melanie, passed from breast cancer in March of 2019, and I've always wanted to be an author my whole life. I actually wrote my first book in 1997. Um, you know, back then, self-publishing wasn't quite what it is today, and yeah, I tried to get it traditionally published and didn't, and you know, kind of got busy. Life got in the way. Started, got married, started having kids, and kind of got away from that, but I'd actually written two books before. And then after she passed, you know, I was just really compelled to tell our story and share the story of what she went through in her cancer battle, you know, leave that for our kids and for others, just lessons learned along the way. And um, so, yeah, I, you know, for a few months after she passed, I, I was making some notes and thinking about it, but it was a little too raw and real at the time, a little too painful, you know, with the grief still. But then after that, I kind of found my voice and got into it and wrote the book. And about a year after she passed, I published it. So, Yeah, got it. Yeah, I know we'll get into the story about uh, what your, you and your wife went through. Um, what, did, what was the two books before um, in the past? Were they, were they nonfiction or fiction? What, what were they about? They're a fiction, very different. Um, my first book was totally different. It was a fictional, I call it a spiritual thriller. Um, completely different than this one, but uh, phenomenal. I mean, it just uh, it was a phenomenal experience to write it, and I'm looking forward to publishing it somewhere soon. And then yeah. the second book is actually it was fiction, but sort of a mix of fiction nonfiction because I actually wrote that a few several years later in about 2005 after my dad passed, and um, it, I kind of took a lot of stories of our childhood. And I, I kind of wanted to reflect on the best parts of childhood and our family and our past, and. I took a whole bunch of stories that really happened over years in our family and kind of condensed them down in this one kind of fictional story that happens over the course of a long weekend. Um, but it, it, it's fiction because it, it didn't happen anywhere near the way I wrote it, but it's all based on real stuff at the same time. But it's, it's, it's a very fun book. It's really, it's about a lot of the funniest, best things of childhood, basically. Got it. Got it. And yeah, the, the, your uh, current book, um, Ordinarily Extraordinary, goes into uh, very raw and details about, you know, what happened to your wife. And, you know, reading the book, there was a couple of things that stood out for me. But for my audience that don't know the book, tell me about the time, the phone call at the grocery store that evening that, that changed your life. If you if you want to go back to memory lane and, and tell us about how it yeah. sort of kicked off. And that's where the story picks up. So she had had a three and a half year battle with cancer, breast cancer, and it had metastasized. Even going through chemo, radiation, double mastectomy, it still it was so aggressive that it kept spreading. So it got into her bones and just kept moving. And three and a half years into her battle, um, one day she started having strokes. She was starting to get blood clots and having strokes, and that's where the story picks up. And that everything in there is exactly really true. What really happened? How it happened? And I got a call from her and rushed home and she was on the couch and um, she couldn't speak. The stroke was affecting her speech. And, you know, we called 911, the paramedics, everybody showed up. And, you know, the the story just continues from there in and out of the hospital for the next several weeks, uh, mostly in. And then she ended up, her liver failed, she ended up passing uh, a few weeks later. And then the story continues through that and then the funeral and then what, three... It, basically, the story concludes about three weeks later on what would have been our 19th wedding anniversary. Yeah, but got it. also along the way, I share a whole lot of backstory because part of the thing I realized I started telling the story is in order for readers to really see it through my eyes, through our eyes, and understand what we were experiencing, how, why we felt the way we did or reacted the way we did to things. I, I shared backstory about myself and childhood, our marriage. That's where it really got raw and real. You know, I didn't want to pretend we were perfect people. I wanted to tell the real story and all, you know, all the ugliness that goes on and, you know, my own life and my own background and just bad thoughts I had, stupid things I did, you know, get honest about that. And then also, you know, marital turmoil we had. I, you know, we had a great relationship overall and a lot of humor in it, but I also got real about marital conflicts and things we had too. And so it's, it's a very real book in that way. 
Yeah, I know you go into a lot of detail, like the chemo party and uh, things like that as well. So when when did you just meet? What What is the backstory? So give us a little bit of a, a take on um, sort of what your younger years were like, what you did for work and and what was the journey through through the marriage? The initial way we met was pretty funny. Um, kind of make a long story short. She, we were out one night. We live in St. Louis and it was after we had both been out of college. So yeah, I was a little bit older than her, but she was mid twenties. I was upper twenties, but, uh, I actually saw an old friend, someone I grew up with, but I hadn't seen in years. And uh, we were out in a bar, um, a pub in St. Louis. And <laughs> I, I was with a buddy of mine. I told my buddy to go and he's older than me and I'm a little older than them. So it was clear he was much older. And I had him go over to the girl I'd grown up with and start saying he knew her and he grew up with her. And uh, he was like rattling off teachers names. I told him to say from our school and people in the neighborhood and, she's just looking at him like you're crazy (laughs) she couldn't figure out how this guy knew all this stuff and then he kind of walks away and he's like i don't think she really bought it and it was just having fun with her so i went over and said hi and she didn't recognize me at first and then i introduced and explained who i was and she's like oh yeah she goes there's this other guy in here and i'm like i know i put him up to it he's my friend and so he came over and then her and her friends came over and we the whole group of us just started hanging out and melanie was one of her friends so you know, I always tell people I picked her up in a bar. That's my side of the story. Her side of the story is we met through a friend, both of which are actually true. But, <laughs> but you know, we had a lot of fun in our life. We were just, we're people we just wanted to always have fun. You know, she had a ton of friends. She was just one of those people who could make friends anywhere, anytime. So, you know, a lot of our younger years, we, we, uh, we dated and, and we're together for about two and a half years before we actually got married. And then when we got married, we, we actually, we, we were together a few years married before we actually had our first kid. So as we got older, our kids are still much younger because we kind of started late. But um, we just had a lot of fun when we were, you know, in our initial years of being married when we were together. Because, again, we're just going out with all her friends and some of, you know, I always joke that she had 4,000 friends and I have four. <laughs> but, you know, we get together with people and get out just always doing something, traveling or just getting out and having a fun life and it's always the way we live. We always just had a very positive, fun life and had a good time. Yeah. And you said you've got four kids. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Boys yeah. or girls? Three boys, one girl. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. I feel yeah. sorry for the girl. I've got uh, one boy and one girl myself, <laughs> but um, yeah, four kids. That's that's fantastic. And yeah. uh, work-wise, what, what was your sort of younger years in your 20s and 30s for work? What, what, did, what did you get up to? You know, I was bounced around. I did a lot of different things. I mean, um, I, I, mostly in software, I was actually a business analyst at, at Boeing on airplanes and manufacturing. And then I kind of moved back into computer programming, which is something I taught myself younger. And I, I even forayed into sales for just a little bit for a couple of years, but then kind of moved back to programming. And then I spent most of my career as a computer programmer, database architect, systems designer, and that um, built software systems, stuff like that. Yeah. But, you know, along the way, I did a lot of writing, even not only studying the art and craft of writing and going to a lot of, you know, writing festivals or taking courses on writing. I also did technical writing within my job. Whenever we needed that done, I was kind of volunteered because I just like to write. And as I've already talked about, I wrote a couple of books along the way over the years. And then, um, but then, you know, when all this came about and I got this book published, I'm really, you know, diving deep into just trying to live in this world, and, you know, be a writer and publisher and not worry about the other stuff yeah yeah um i want to jump into the book and some of the the chapter topics and sort of expand on on what they're about so chapter two you talk about the uplifting f-bomb um yes. what's that about so the f-bomb obviously was it's um when she was having the strokes and it affected her speech and she almost you know she really couldn't talk the f-bomb was actually the one word she could still say perfectly clearly <laughs> so it was really funny and it was uplifting because <clears throat> it was literally the one thing she turned and said that to me and um it was the one thing where i knew like because she was like almost frozen with the stroke and not being able to speak and i didn't know what i didn't know at the time it was a stroke i didn't know what it was so it was it was very uplifting because it showed her mind was still functioning and she was aware of what was going on and how to react to it and everything else. So it was actually amazingly uplifting just to hear her say that one word. And then, you know, the way it works, it, it, I explain in the book when you go through this in a stroke is it's not like it happens and that's just the way it is from now on. It kind of comes in these little cycles and ways. So her speech would come back for a while and then kind of go away and come back and go away. So it was all part of that whole experience of just, uh, 
you know, of dealing with trying to figure out what it was we were dealing with and what was actually going on and happening to her. Yeah. And in the book, you go through sort of backstories and and tangents as well. Um, Any stories on, on that you want to go through? You know, in general, not the specific stories, maybe, but, you know, I just share. This is one of the ways the, the book, it's just very real, very raw, real. As I shared, you know, I had some really tough times as a kid. It's, it's complicated. Like, I had a good childhood overall, um, but, you know, I had some tough times. It was like family, my mom, and the environment we were in. I grew up Catholic, and in, in the area we were in, it was just, you know, there's people always joke about the old Catholic guilt. <laughs> You're always made to feel guilty about everything you do. And, and I'm not knocking Catholicism by any means, but you know, there's, there's elements of the environment there. And also just where I grew up and how there's a very competitive environment, very critical. It's like everything you always did was wrong. And essentially I grew up in an environment where I had a huge inferiority complex. It, you know, it didn't really do me a lot of good. And it, it, because of that, as I got a little older, you know, I really, kind of failed out of college there for a while just not because I couldn't do it but because I just didn't believe in it you know and um, I kind of really hit rock bottom at one point in my early 20s and that's where my whole life turned around because I kind of picked myself up off of that and went back to school finished college did a lot of other things and you know started learning to grow some confidence believe in myself and move forward in life and so that's that's a lot of the backstory I share as far as me I shared some about Melanie and then again like I talked about before I get really raw and real about some marital conflicts and fights we had and how, you know, a lot of that stemmed from that growing up. You know, that's where all the backstory is relevant because it shows what we went through, why it led to this later, why it even, it even affected, you know, the way we were dealing with medical staff and things like that in the hospital. So, Mm -hmm. you know, all one thing kind of flowed to another, but that, you know, that guy kind of fought through a lot over that through the years to get to where I was. And then, then, you know, kind of built this really great life and then here she gets diagnosed with cancer and ends up passing three and a half years later yeah and segueing into the next chapter you talk about toughness to find uh what do you what do you mean by that you know what one of the things is it was amazing to watch <clears throat> and that's kind of the key story in that chapter is how you know growing up in fear and in, with an inferiority complex and, and it's complicated it's like i just walked around not doing anything because i still played sports i was a wrestler and you know i was always trying to figure out you know you're a guy you want to be tough and i was always like what is toughness or you know because sometimes you'd be tough in one way not another this and that and <clears throat> i share this whole story with melanie in the hospital and she again was one of those people who could just make friends anywhere anytime just just an unbelievable way and there was this whole story when she was in her hospital room and she's just at a low point, <clears throat> you know, she's realizing she's going to die. <clears throat> and she has, they, she's in a double occupancy room and has this roommate. And the roommate comes in and Melanie's just like making it all about the roommate, kind of putting her on a pedestal. It was just amazing to watch. And <clears throat> I realized it at the time, but I kind of realized and defined it more later about <clears throat> just realizing how much, you know, when you're at that moment where she was at, if you ever had an excuse to just not be nice to someone else or just make it all about you and, you know, <clears throat> almost be rude to people or something and you'd have an excuse for why, well, we'll look at what she's going through. But even in those moments, <clears throat> Melanie was so amazing. She had this toughness of spirit that she was still putting other people first and still <clears throat> making it awesome for them. And I just realized like, that's, <clears throat> that's like the greatest form of toughness to, be going through something so bad and just kind of almost put yourself to the side, put other people first, even a stranger you don't know that you don't owe anything to. It was just amazing how just tough and resilient she was in that way. Yeah. Yeah. It it does go to show, you know, people's character when uh, hard situations come and, and how they react. Um, Yeah. It's a testament to, to her. You talk about the, the chemo party. What, what is the chemo party? What went down? Uh, that's another funny one that shows her spirit that um, <clears throat> she went into chemo. She did chemo every three weeks. So her very first chemo appointment, I took her in and was with her. And the whole room was as sad as could be. You know, you can imagine people going through cancer, get chemotherapy. It's not any fun. And it was a very just uh, macabre, for lack of a better word, uh, room. Just uh, very sad. And, and Melanie kind of brightened it a little bit. You know, she was just being fun, talking to people, and brought spirits up a little, which was nice. The second, three weeks later, she had her second treatment. She went into chemo, and her, I couldn't take her that day because of a work thing. 
Um, I came over later, but her friend, who's kind of like her, took her. And her friend had kind of brought some games and stuff just so they'd have something to do because it took hours to do all the infusions. And I show up at like noon, and she's already been in there for like three hours. And as I'm coming in, I'm just hearing what sounds like a party. Like, I hear all these people laughing, joking. And I was assuming it was like a staff birthday party or something. I figured the doctors and nurses were off some room. And instead I go in, and they're like basically, excuse me, <laughs> having a party in the chemo room. Like all, like all the patients, the people who the week before just looked so sad are all like laughing and joking and playing these games. And, you know, as I was Melanie and her friends and that's how they were, they just, they take even the saddest, you know, like chemotherapy where people are just not in a good mood and just turn it into a party. It was just amazing to watch and see how she could just do that anytime, anywhere. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. And who's the, um, who's the, the cow bell guy? Who, who who's that who's that character? <laughs> uh, if you know the actor Christopher Walken, yeah, 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 Christopher Walken. Um, you know he's been famous in a lot, a lot of movies. I don't know if you ever saw it, but there was a Saturday Night Live skit years ago where he came in, and there's a, a Blue Oyster Cult song they're singing, and there's a cowbell sound in it. And in, in the Saturday Night Live skit, he keeps telling the guys he wants more cowbell. It's a really, it's one of the funnier Saturday Night Live skits I've ever seen. It was a really funny skit. He's really well known for it. And uh, at one point after she'd been done with chemo, Melanie's hair was growing back. And if you remember Christopher Walken, he has his hair and it kind of sticks up like a wave. Yeah. Her hair had grown back just like that. <laughs> got it. And uh, we actually <clears throat> kind of got in a fight one night. And I never said much about her, you know, losing her hair or hair or anything. Um, and then we got in kind of a fight one night. And I <laughs> I said something to her like, hey, Christopher Walken hair. <laughs> And at first I was like, oh, God, why did I do that? Because I didn't want to make her feel bad about her hair. And she just had this stunned look on her face. And then all of a sudden she starts laughing and she's like, that's it. She's like, I've been trying to figure out what my hair looks like. And we actually got online and like pulled up a picture of him. We're comparing it. And she did. She had exactly his hairdo. And uh, so we always, you know, would joke about her cowbell hairdo or the cowbell guy all the time. That became kind of a running joke with us after that. Yeah. Yeah, you can also go through the book about mystery episodes explained. Um, do you want to touch on that, or just go back into rebound and, and relapse? Or um, it's yeah, it's all the same. Um, the, it goes back to what I said earlier about with the strokes and how it's not just it kind of comes and goes in cycles. And we yeah. didn't know that. I had no idea. I'd never really dealt with stroke before, so I didn't realize that's what happened. I always thought like a stroke was like one big event. Boom! It happened. It's over. But actually, for like two days, she kept going through these cycles again, which I mentioned earlier, where she'd like lose her speech and come back. And we kept having all these crazy communications with the medical staff. And it was really annoying because one of them would kind of say, well, she's having a stroke. And we're like, well, is it another stroke? And they'd be like, well, no, she's not having another stroke. And then they could never explain it. And we were so confused because we're like, well, the first stroke's over. But then they were telling us she's not having another stroke. And we couldn't figure out what these like mystery episodes were. Until finally somebody explained to us the way stroke actually works and how it comes and goes in cycles over a period of time. And it's not one, just one big event. Yeah. And it, it took like two or three days for somebody to finally explain that to us in a way we could understand. So, <clears throat> yeah, that, that basically is what the... And, but, you know, that's a huge part of the book because that goes through more than one chapter where we were dealing with that for quite a while through this whole ordeal. And we just couldn't figure out what the heck was going on. Yeah. Who's um who is Janice and Bobby? Oh, Janice Joplin. Um, Janice Joplin, the singer who sang a song "Me and Bobby McGee." If you're familiar with that song, no, no, Melanie no. actually used to. We when we go out a lot of times with friends, we used to like going to places that had bands. Melanie would actually get up on stage with the local bands around town, and she would sing Janice Joplin's "Me and Bobby McGee" up on stage all the time, and so it kind of became her her go to song and. Yeah, we had, we ended up pulling that up on somebody's phone, and then we were even <coughs> sorry, I get a little choked up, but we were even listening to that song as she was passing away, you know, on that last day. And you um you the sort of the second last chapter, you go into the tone of the extraordinary. What what do you mean by the tone of the extraordinary? I think that, that really sums up <clears throat> kind of the lessons I learned through all of this, and you know, over the years, it's just. You know, if you look at us <clears throat> on paper, on the surface, we're very ordinary people. We live in a very modest house, very small one, really. Um, 
you know, we don't have anything fancy. Like all the struggling I did for years, and even though I had a good job, just because of different setbacks, different situations, I've never really, never really managed to really get ahead. So, you know, I don't live in a mansion. You know, we just seem like very ordinary, average people. But I'd actually say, you know, I, I live the most extraordinary life because we had such a great life together. You know, any amount of money couldn't have made our life more fun. I mean, sure, we might have gotten to do some better things or had a nicer house or car or something. But, like, you know, as much as we and the people around us in our community just look ordinary on the outside, it's just such an extraordinary life. And it's it's that gratitude and that appreciation for that. <clears throat> and that was part of the whole positive tone and the moving forward and the lessons learned was, you know, I didn't look back on our life and look at what happened <clears throat> as a tragedy that she died. I from the beginning, you know, from right about the time it happened, I kept telling myself and thinking and believing that it would have been a tragedy if I never had her in my life. And so that's all what the tone of the extraordinary is really about is, you know, appreciating what you do have, not sitting there worrying about what you don't or what you want to attain, but being grateful for all the great things you have in your life and seeing how extraordinary your life actually is, even if it maybe to other people looking in from the outside, it may not look that way. Yeah, well, that's uh, I agree with you 100%. It's uh, it's not about sort of what you have, it's what you do with what you have and, and enjoying sort of life uh, as it comes. Um, and the last chapter, right. you, you talk about the, the middle pieces. Uh, explain a little bit about what, what the middle pieces are. The middle pieces, kind of an analogy, but it's also direct. Um, like it was just kind of a play on what, one of our first dates <clears throat> when I really kind of fell for Melanie we had gone to this local place as pizza and it was one of those times where I just realized her incredible spirit. And I was got this pizza there and it's like a real thin pizza. I don't know what kind of pizza, but you know, in the United States, like in different regions, there's all different kinds of pizza. St. Louis is famous for a really thin crust. And anyway, the way they cut it is in like squares. So the middle, she always liked the middle pieces, but um, I was joking about how she kept like talking to the waiter, our waiter or staff, so much that she didn't even eat like she was so busy having fun and having this conversation but like i'd sit there and kind of be eating while she's talking and having fun but i'd say the middle pieces for her <clears throat> and that's um kind of part of right near the end of the book that's one of the ending scenes where on a, three weeks after she passed would have been our 19th wedding anniversary <clears throat> you know went back <coughs> excuse me Went back to that same place and ordered pizza and kind of hung out there for a little bit and was talking to some of the staff and, you know, kind of saved her the middle pieces. Yeah, that's a, that's a nice way to end the book. And, um, yeah, it's a beautiful story. What was um, what was your relationship? Are you, are, you, are you a spiritual person, um, you know, especially with God? But what's what was your sort of spiritual convictions at the time or your relationship sort of with God going through all that as well? Um, I'm not sure if you touch on that in in the book a bit or i do just a little bit in the book because that's the way i am in life like i actually have a very deep faith you know i have no doubt god exists i am very strong in my faith but but i'm also not the kind of person who runs around shoving that in people's faces so to speak you know i i'm not one who you know to me it's like a personal thing and experience and, and not that i don't share it if people ask just like now but yeah i'm not i'm not kind of preachy so to speak right and um so, you know, I'd say about that, and, and I don't, I, I kind of believe the Lord helps those who help themselves. That's like one of the key things I always fall back to. And so, you know, I, when I pray, I pray for God to do what's best for us, but I don't necessarily ask him to, like, intervene. I'm not sure I believe he, like, intervenes a lot in our lives. I think he more, it's more letting things happen the way they happen and accepting what happened and moving on and becoming stronger, you know, that type of thing. And, and you know, sometimes I wonder, I do have moments, I think maybe he does intervene in little ways, this and that, you know, I don't know, but, um, but yeah, so I have a very strong faith, but I, I feel like I maybe have a slightly different outlook about it than most Christians or people do, yeah. but, um, but it does, it carries me through a lot of things as I realize no matter what happens, I can always move forward, move on, you know, and stay strong, just, you know, you know, like accepting her death and accepting that's just what was meant to be or whatever and, and moving on from it, you know, and I'm not saying that was easy. I don't mean to try and make it sound easy. It takes a while, but, uh, but you go through those stages of grief and you deal with it, but you know, you keep that focus. So, yeah, I mean, I think my faith and my beliefs were definitely a huge part of what kept me 
focused and constructive and positive moving forward throughout all of this. Yeah, and um, yeah, I agree, and thank you for sharing. And obviously, since the passing, um, you sort of share your story of hope and inspiration to people, you know, cancer victims, caregivers, and, and anyone overcoming trauma um, and tragedy in their lives and relationships. Um, you're also an active supporter at the American Cancer Society, and uh, you help out with a camp. What is the camp that you uh, assist with? What's that called? It's called... It's called Camp Kesem, and it's just a phenomenal organization. <clears throat> it was started um, for kids who have a parent with cancer. And it was it's actually, it's a national organization in the United States. It covers all over across the country. But it's, it's, it's run through colleges and universities here. So all the like, camp counselors are college students. So we're in St. Louis. We're in St. Louis, Missouri. This St. Louis University chapter so that's the camp we go to, but there's camps just all over the place. But uh, yeah, our kids from the first year Melanie was diagnosed, they got to start going to the camp. And, you know, and it's great because they get out there with other kids going through similar, the same things as them. And, you know, they, they mostly make it about fun, but they do have a few times they sit down and have chats or one, one thing they call the empowerment ceremony where like kids will share their stories. So it's one of those things where I think my kids benefit. It's more than they realize they did probably even by far that, they already saw other kids who'd already dealt with, you know, parent having passed and things and saw how these kids were still having fun and living life. And I think it's just so phenomenal for these kids who are dealing with this because they're in this whole community of people who have sh- the same shared experiences. And it's just so powerful for them. <clears throat> and I'm just, I'm a huge advocate for Camp Kessim. I'm, I'm now actually on the advisory board of the St. Louis University chapter of it. And I do a lot of fundraising for them and support them and, I just think it's a phenomenal organization. Yeah, good work. That's good stuff. And yeah, a lot of people don't think about what gets left over after, you know, someone deals with cancer and, and passes, you know, not just the, the, the widower like yourself, but the kids as well and everyone else that gets affected. So definitely need that support system um, to encourage people, help and, and move forward. Uh, what would be any lessons for people that haven't gone through, you know, maybe a death or, or cancer in the family that maybe in the future if someone goes through it, uh, what would be any lessons that you would you would give someone sort of experience in this new, this new reality? Well, I'll give you three or four quick ones. You know, number one, I'd say definitely reach out and get help. You know, like there are, like we're part of American Cancer Society. You know, that's another organization I support and deal with. And then they helped us out a lot through our whole journey and struggle. And then Camp Kesem, which we just talked about. And there's just so many people, organizations out there ready and willing to help. And, you know, don't be too proud or too whatever. You know, reach out, get help, you know, be part of your community because there's tons of people who want to contribute and organizations out there built to do that. So definitely get help. I'd say the biggest lessons I've ever learned throughout this, and I just think this is so critical, is just to understand the power of choice. Your your own pride is your own choices because no matter what happens to you, you always have a choice, you know, and you, I, I could sit there and play the victim and be like, well, I didn't have any choice that Melanie died. Well, no, I didn't have a choice that she died, but I absolutely had choices of how I dealt with it, to set that positive tone, to move forward, to appreciate the years we had. You know, those are all choices, and we have so many more choices, and we, we really, we have such a power to control and choose where we're going and what we're doing, how we react to things, and you know, a couple other quick lessons I think go with that is, is one, I, I, you know, I, people are always telling you to be positive and I do agree with that in a sense, but I, I don't like using the word positive because I feel like it's misleading because, you know, you're not going to feel positive all the time. You're, you know, you're gonna, you know, it's a choice to realize like you're going to go through moments and times when you're sad or you're angry or grieving and you're not going to feel positive at all, but you can always be constructive and constructive is the word I choose to use. You know, you can always be doing something to keep doing better, even if you're not feeling happy or positive at the time about it. And I'd say the last thing I'd say then is, you know, I'd also say, and it kind of goes with the first thing, and all these lessons go together, really, but, you know, remind yourself and reinforce yourself of all these lessons and more all the time. Like, I didn't, you know, years ago, I'd never really read, like, self-help books or different inspirational books and things, and now I realize that's so powerful, and it doesn't mean you have to be like a raw, again, a raw, raw person who runs around trying to act like everything's positive and great all the time. But, you know, there's all kinds of books out there like Chicken Soup for the Soul or Jack Hanfield or Tony Robbins and so many more, Brene Brown. You know, get those in your life and get them around you. Put inspiring quotes up on the walls in your house or wherever and, 
you know, keep reminding and reinforcing yourself of these lessons. Because it's not like you learn a lesson in life once and then you're just good. Like we all fall back into old feelings, old habits, old, you know, things. And, and to keep, and plus you change as you grow, right? So you're getting different perspectives. So to keep, to keep these positive, constructive things in front of you and then to keep, keep feeding yourself that every day, it's almost like exercise. It's like exercising for your psyche, right? And I'd really encourage people to do that. Like I wish I'd started it younger because I probably would have been more confident and you know, more capable of just doing all the things I wanted to do in my life because it's just so important to keep those, keep reminding and reinforcing those lessons really as often as you can on a daily basis if you can. Yeah, just to recap, great lessons. So help, choice, construction, and I like the one reinforce. So definitely reinforcing. And I love that word, uh, construct, constructive, sorry, constructive. Because, right. yeah, you, you can be positive, you can be negative, but some of those maybe be a bit too high and low, but being constructive, everyone, every day can do something constructive that's going to make their future just that little bit better as well. Um, right. Just going to segue, you said about Jack Canfield. What's his relationship with the book? And I, I believe he did the the, the intro as well. Or talk, talk to me about your relationship with uh, Jack Canfield. Yeah, he did a review of it. It was awesome. For those who don't know, he's the co-author of the Chicken Soup for the Soul books and series. And now he he writes like the Success Principles and a lot of other things. And he's just a phenomenal speaker and coach. And um, I was in a writer's group and then a publishing group. And uh, I was part of him and ended up doing a workshop with this group. And he was one of the leaders of the workshop. And as part of the workshop, he read some of the books of us who were attending, including mine. Um, and you know, he got kind of introduced to me from some of the other people from this other workshop we were in, but, um, he, yeah, he ended up reading the book and absolutely loved it. And he actually interviewed me. He has a little show he does and he interviewed me about the book. It's on my, you know, website and on my social media, but, um, he interviewed me about the book and just had some great, great things to say about it. He just really loved it. He recommended anybody to read it. And, you know, so now that, that quotes in the book, um, you know, it's up everywhere you know we use those quotes all the time of course because what a phenomenal person to get you know get absolutely some really great get a over really 100, great 100, and, 110 million books sold so no small yeah. fry author through there right yeah that that's great and and just to go into what you're doing at the moment so talk to me about the publishing company and about how you're helping first-time authors um talk about that I, i'm a first-time author myself and you know everyone needs to share their story and have a platform of um how to market their book so do you want to just deep right. dive into that just a little bit yeah that's thank you for asking that that's great so when, when i self-published i formed a company a publishing company and at first i you know i was really more just focused on myself and my book and not so much the company itself it was more there for formality but then i met up with an old colleague who came on with me and she's just phenomenal great marketing person, great background in like media publishing, different things. And so she came on and we decided, you know, and I wanted to do this in a way anyway, but I couldn't have done it. I wouldn't have the time to just do it on my own. And, and the, the breadth of all the, the knowledge we bring the two of us together, you know, we, we put it all together, but essentially we, we Patty P publishing is what the publishing company's called. And we, we've started working on services and help the other authors. Cause like I told you earlier in this show, you know, I started writing in 1997. I think I mentioned that anyway, that's when I wrote my first book. And I, I think I talked about, you know, how I tried to traditionally publish and it was so hard, but then now over the years with how much the web web has evolved and all the different technologies, you know, self publishing has become so much more of an option, you know, very viable option now that, um, everything I learned, even with everything I learned over the years, because I always kept my head in the game, there were still things I didn't know and things I was struggling with. Um, am I there? Yeah, you're still here. Yeah, yep, still yep. Here. yep. Oh, so I don't know. Something just disappeared on my computer. That's okay. Um, That's okay. So, yeah, I, um, so, yeah, as I move forward, I, um, you know, we, we decide, I really, I've always been the type of person I like teaching. I like sharing what I learn with people anyway. And so I really wanted to give back. And so we're, we're really working on helping other new authors because a lot of people get into writing a book. I talk to people every day because I'm in all kinds of writers groups and stuff. You know, maybe they get into writing a book or want to write a book, but they really don't know what to do and they're not sure what to do with it. And they're always asking kind of what's next. So one of the things we're doing right now is we're even as we're growing that company, we're doing a webinar actually later this month on kind of a roadmap for new authors to understand here's what you're getting into here's a lot of the key things you're going to have to do 
as you move from, you know, there's really stages from writing to publishing and then ongoing promotion beyond that. And we really break that down and share a lot of great tips on, in this webinar on how to how to be prepared for that and what to think about in advance and how to, you know, move through the transitions of each phase. Yeah, perfect. And I think it's a great platform that, that what you're doing and helping people share their story and giving them the tips and tricks on um, first time sort of writing a book and, and getting into it. But Patrick, I, I thank you for sort of sharing your story. And just before we wrap up, just want to ask you um, a quick little question. So if you were to host a dinner party with three people from the past, famous, dead or alive, who would they be and uh, what would you serve them? I'm interested to, to hear you three. Um, wow. Um if I, any three people from the past, dead or alive? Yeah, yeah, and of course Melanie will be there. Of course, that that's absolutely fine. But uh, who well, else? in this day and age, one of the people I think's been one of the most influential out there, and especially is very influential for writers, would be Oprah Winfrey. I'd probably invite her. Yep. Um, the second one, I would have. I mean, to me, it'd be crazy not to invite Jesus Christ. Yep. I, I don't care what your beliefs are. I don't care if you're an atheist. It's still one of the most influence probably the single most influential person who's ever lived almost probably or close to it definitely top five right yeah. one way or another so regardless of your faith or your belief you have to invite him right and then yeah absolutely i'd want i'd love to see melanie again bring her back that'd be phenomenal so i think those three would be a great three people to bring together that'd be a heck of a dinner yeah you know you get one more as well you get one more oh one more person yep you get one more um abraham yeah, lincoln maybe well, Lincoln, Lincoln, Oprah, and Jesus—that would be uh, that would be a great great party. And what would what would you serve them? Would you take them out, or would you would you cook a meal at home, or would you take them to a restaurant? Well, I guess I'd like to ask them before I just chose what they like. No, no, no. You you get to cho- you get to choose. I mean, I'd probably go for a really good steak dinner if I was just going to choose without asking them. It would have to be private dining because if anyone that's seen Lincoln and Jesus and Oprah in the one table would uh, be a bit of a fanfare, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, quite the interesting that, meal no that that's awesome but uh, i appreciate you sharing your story and where can my audience sort of um, find the book and buy it um what's the best place for them to to go and buy your book oh thanks i appreciate you asking that yeah it's on amazon and we're set up you know all the links so actually even like if you're in you know the uk or australia or canada or any other country besides the us it, it's on the distribution sites within those countries um, so you can go to the UK, Amazon, or, you know, Australia, Amazon, whatever. Um, but yeah, on Amazon is a great place to get it. Also, if you just want to connect with me or learn more and find out that stuff, I have an author website. It's patrickplong.com. So don't forget the P in the middle, patrickplong.com. And there's links on there to go buy the book. And we're also registered. There's a thing called Ingram Spark that's for retailers where, it puts you in all the databases for retailers. So actually the book is available anywhere books are sold. So you could go to, you know, any bookstore or, you know, retailer who sells books and you could get the book there as well too, if you needed to. Yeah. Just want to touch on your middle name with, uh, about the P. Can you talk about what, what the P is? It's not your middle name, is it? No, my middle name is actually J, uh, my middle initial, my middle name is actually James. Um, there is a joke and it, I want to be careful that I don't want to go too long because it can be a little bit of a long story. But I played basketball in college and I had a friend on the team and he started a whole joke where every day he'd walk in and he'd go, hey, Patrick P. Long. You go, the P stands for. And just whatever we were doing at the time would be the P. So he might be like putting on your shoes or if he saw me in a classroom and I was sharpening a pencil, he'd be like, Patrick P. Long, the P stands for sharpening a pencil. It was just this huge running joke for years. And other guys and friends of ours would jump on and do it too. And it was really funny because he kept doing it all through college and so did some of our other friends. And then on actually literally on graduation night, he started to say it. He goes, Patrick P. Law, and he, he stops and he goes, what does the P stand for? And I'm like, I don't know, it stands for whatever you say it stands for. He goes, is that even your real middle initial? I'm like, nope. And we were just laughing hysterically and, and we were just talking about that. So when I went to publish, I'd always kind of wanted to have a pen name. I always thought it was like a cool thing authors did, but some people told me why it's a bad idea to actually have a pen name. And right before I was going to publish a book, I realized, I was sitting there one day and I realized, you know, the perfect blend is to just do Patrick P. Long because it's fun. It's kind of like a pen name since it's not, but yet I'm still using my real name. So like 
when I get on social media and stuff, people aren't confused about whose book it is because it's not some completely fake name. So that that's kind of the quick story of the P. That the story of the, a, a slightly more detailed version of the story is available on my website too. Again, if you want to go there. No, thanks for sharing. No, I did. I did read that. Um, but no, it sounds cool. Patrick B. Long, everyone. So find him, um, follow him, purchase his book, read his book, learn the lessons. And before we wrap up, Patrick, what would be one of sort of any last message or lessons you want to leave my audience with? Yeah, I just say be grateful, you know, in your life for what you have, even through the toughest times, just be grateful for all the great things you had afterwards. Again, that and it goes back to that power of choice. You know, you always have a choice of choosing how you look at things and how you deal with them and how you move forward. Realize that power of choice you have to do that and just and just take advantage of it and take control of your life and move forward and just have a beautiful life by just always choosing to be constructive and positive and moving forward. Yeah, fantastic. Well, thank you for sharing your story and thank you for being a guest on the Best Book Bits podcast. To my audience, go out there, buy his book. Everybody, Patrick B. Long. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you. I really appreciate it. No worries. We'll catch up soon. Thanks. All right, bye.